Thank you, Christina. Appreciate that. Morning, everyone. So, might as well do the introductions. Hope most of you know all of us, but I, <laughs> uh, the team is uh, Jason Cordobanch, who is our uh, architect in Vault and PLM. And then we also have Jose Prada Clara, who is our uh, one of our Vault engineers. And then we also have Adam Board who is our data scientist. He does magic in the background, doing a lot of custom programming and stuff like that for uh, our Vault customers. And then I'm Phil Steiger and I am the practice lead for our Vault and PLM here at Kativ. Um, it's a open forum today to ask any questions that, uh, that you might have around Vault or um, data management. So. I'll kick it off. I think I already have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question is uh, about loading data. Can you load data with meta a metadata or this is in default? Uh, or do you need to uh, load the metadata afterwards? Yeah, so it really depends on, like when you're loading data, like let's say with the auto loader or with task scheduler, you know, you can get the data into vault and then, you know, you can use some of the tools in vault to edit some of the metadata. Um, if you have a lot of, of data, you know, you could work with a reseller like us to work, you know, we have some tools that allows us to bulk um, load the data with um, all the metadata, including categories and custom properties um, or, bulk update the um, the properties after the fact. And so it just depends on how much data you have and and does it make sense to offload it or you know to have you or an intern or someone do it. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, and we do it a lot. It's one of our specialties. We're really good at loading data. I got a question from Brian Kelly. He's asking about uh, setting a vault server in the cloud either Azure, AWS, what's the difference between the two platform? Is there another venue to use for the host? I know you guys, we offer a turnkey solution, yes, but we don't have Kativ as a reseller. I can answer that question. Jason, you can answer that question if you want. Yeah, you can. <laughs> um, I don't think there's much of a difference between AWS and Azure. We went with Azure as our hosting provider just because it's Microsoft, you know. Uh, I don't think I, I know customers that have done both, both. and others because you have to remember, you know, it's not, it's a virtual server in the cloud. And so Vault has to be installed on a Windows OS. And so any provider that provides a virtual server that meets the specs that has, you know, supported operating system, the supported version of SQL um, should work. It just goes down to pricing locations and then the complexity of learning that interface to, to set up the virtual networks and the point to point VPN, which is probably the more technical part of it. Whereas, you know, setting up a virtual server, that's not that different than installing Vault on a physical box. So I think it's the it's the infrastructure that's probably the more complicated part between, and that goes back to you know which platform do you know? Yeah, oh, and we've used both too, right? We we had AWS servers at, in the past for testing, and yes, uh, eventually moved over to to Azure as well. Um, yeah, Adam, have you seen anything different as far as development on your on your end? No, they're pretty much the same on the development side of things um i think though jason you might speak to wasn't there a difference in the way of backing up vault or better ways to back up vault in the cloud yeah but the but all platforms have the same features in terms of snapshotting of hard drives and backing up you know i think it really goes back to which sure. cloud no, I'm, i don't i don't mean in a yeah, I don't mean in a difference between Azure or AWS. I mean in a difference between uh, the nuances of setting up backups within a cloud environment versus an on-prem environment. Were there any differences there? No, it's all the same because you, you know you still use Vault Backup. You still have to either snapshot the whole server that includes the the 
the AWS backup or the hard drive that has the backup, or you know, you follow Autodesk white paper on doing a third-party backup. So the way you back up a vault doesn't change if it's on-prem, on-prem on a virtual machine or in the cloud in a virtual environment. It's all the same. Just the, the way that you go about setting up is different, but in the end, you know, you need the backup of all the databases in the file store to have a um, a valid backup. And it's worth testing. Yeah. No, and Brian has a follow up. Sure. To that fully replicated server here in Vancouver, Washington, and connected to Portland. We also have users in India. And I'm looking, you know, for a site replication. I mean, the cloud is perfect. <clears throat> and we've done that. We do have people in the US and we're replicating to India with an AVFS server so that their India location can do work. And I know that in his first uh, question about uh, Kativas and his reseller, I don't know if we have to be a reseller to host your vault. We could do that without having to be a reseller. So. Something worth a conversation if you're interested. Yeah, and we figured out all the nuances when it comes to hosting in the cloud too. We've been working on this for the last almost three years. Yeah, and it's going to take some testing anyway, because again, speeds, you got to make sure that uh, they're good to the locations that you're trying to go to. Um, when we set up the, that server, or like you mentioned, um, file servers, just the, the biggest thing going across the network is the files themselves. So the SQL calls don't don't really cause much much delay there. Um, yeah, the uh -huh. biggest thing is like point to point VPN. It's not not everyone's um, router or switch supports it. And so that's something to be like, especially for small offices. Um, I think that's one of the things to think about. And that's what makes kind of the new feature for the vault gateway kind of nice is giving end users another way of connecting to a vault server without VPN. Um, but that does require um, two licenses, one for the gateway and one for the job processor. So there's pros and cons to both. Uh, I got a question from James. Uh... How do I do a copy design, copy a branch to without copying all of the directories above it? Uh, I and I've seen this happen both ways, actually. I don't know if you have uh, seen this, Jason, where when you copy a branch to a brand new location, it then, instead of copying from that folder location down, it goes all the way up to designs and copies that whole structure into the new folder as well. And I'm assuming that's what you mean, James, where it's copying the whole the whole top level folder all the way down to, to the parts and, and assemblies uh, in the new location. Um, oh, is the goal to basically duplicate? Oh, I see. You go from like FS two hundred to FS three three three, and only kind of recreate the folder structure for them there down, and not the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like in his example, it recreates designs and equipment again under Inventor. Sorry, guys, I'm answering questions also. Um, I'd have to run some tests. I, I can't remember because it's like the, I know the copy branch is the whole thing. I'm curious if there's a way to do it so that it, it only brings some of it, but you might have to create the folder that you want and then copy it over. Yeah, because you would think it would go like just copy a brand new portion of that. Um, 
or like a brand new copy of the assembly into the new folder that you recreated. Um, so it's my understanding that it's not supposed to create the whole folder structure. So it might be something, because uh, when you do it with a part, if you say copy, copy to, instead of copy branch to, it behaves differently within the client. And that might be something, James, I don't know if, if you've tried it uh, to, to do a copy to, it, does it act differently when you do a copy to versus a copy branch? Yeah, so it behaves differently in, in copy branch versus copy to, it seems. So it sounds like you want copy to so that it recreates the assembly and the subfolders for the assembly, but not the entire folder path. Yes. So like copy to will copy just the assembly and then you have to select all the individual parts underneath it if you want to, uh, to do the same. But copy branch will grab everything. But in this case, when you do copy branch, it just recreates the folder structure as well. So that might be something we troubleshoot off line there, James. So let's set up, I think, a call to, to kind of replicate it. Because I've seen it both. I've seen it work correctly. And I've seen it work in the way that you're describing. So it definitely be something that we can take a look at and, and look into it. And if anyone in the chat um, has experienced this or um, has also run into it, just um, let me know if A, you've gotten around it, or B, you're also uh, experiencing these, these kinds of issues. If we have time at the end, we can share a screen and, and do a couple once we work through all the questions, if there's time. I got a uh, question from Gordon. He might need to clarify his question, but he's, please specify whether answers apply to both Vault Basic and Vault Professional or just Professional with the answers. Thanks. Are you talking about all of our answers or? I think specific? he needs in general. Yeah. Yeah. And in the case of the last answer, it's, it's a little different based on whether using Basic or Pro because the copy design functions look a little different. So that one, the the workflow we were talking about in the previous question from James is specifically in uh, Vault Professional where I've seen it. James, is that also where you're 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 using it? Because if if you're seeing it in Vault Basic, then I would I would um, I haven't tried it in Vault Basic. Yeah, so he's using Professional, which is where I've seen it. Um, if any, anyone has seen it in Vault Basic, please talk, let us know as well. But that one specifically, I would say professional. I've got another question, and it's uh, uh, can I uh, apply metadata to existing uh, files inside a vault, bulk load metadata, basically? Jason, I'll let you answer that question. Yeah, so there's no out of the box feature for bulk loading metadata to files. Um, you can, there is an import export for items. So there's a, a way to load metadata on an item. But in terms of the file, um, there requires a special tool to go to bulk load metadata. In terms of inside of all, you would have to select, you know, up to 100 files and use the edit property if you want to update properties that way. Which ends up working like if you're doing a hundred at a time, it that edit properties window ends up working like an Excel sheet. So you can kind of like if they're all getting the same value or similar values, you can kind of do that that way. But yeah, the, definitely for larger numbers, definitely use the um the bulk load or the bulk tool that we have. Whereas like in Vault Basic, you know, you can edit information, but Vault Basic doesn't have the property grid on the right. You have to add that um, the property to the header, and then you can edit it individually. So it's even harder to edit metadata in Vault Basic. Uh, Mike uh, says the issue copy branch common problem also. 
chat is desirable for this session. Yeah, sorry. Uh, when I meant chat, I meant, I guess, the, the question. The question box, sorry, misspoke there. <laughs> um, what are the pros and cons of items? <laughs> it's follow up the loaded question, I know, from Brian. So, I, when I think about items, I always go back to we have to talk about the differences between file based lifecycle and items. And so, like, that the first main difference is being able to see bomb data in vault without having to open it up in inventor and then look at the bomb in inventor. And so, in my mind, you don't, you would use items when you have CAD files that have bomb data. So, inventor, AutoCAD electrical, um, was it AutoCAD? Um, what's it's not, um, I'm forgetting which there's one AutoCAD, it's mechanical. And so, it's like, so if you're using one of those three programs, then you know you have files that contain item data. Now there are ways to create items from, you know, a regular CAD file, but then you have to ask yourself, if I'm not getting bomb data out of it, why do I need an item? And then that goes back to the second question: is that most of the time, items are used to link Vault or a PDM server to a different system like PLM or an ERP system, and so. I guess those are really the two pros to items is being able to see bomb data in vault without being able to open up the CAD file and having item numbers that you can link one-to-one -to, -one to an ERP or PLM system so that you can leverage those technologies. I'll, uh, I'll add that I also have seen items used in the past for companies that maybe want to associate um, some sort of uh, standards or whatever that are supposed to remain along with a particular part or item basically as a, yeah basically as a collection or a way to uh, consolidate uh, related files together in one spot like a manual or something yeah, yeah like, a standard cause... or some sort of a certification for material or whatever may need to stay along with a particular part so I think about like items as like a folder. And so the item is like a container, like a folder, and then you can attach or put things in that folder. And so you could have the CAD data, it could be a release PDF, it could be CNC data, it could be spec requirements. Um, if you're in edit mode in an item and the files in vault, you can drag and drop it into an item. But again, you could do the same organizational thing with folders. And so that's why I go back to like the does the file you have have bomb data and or do you need an item number to be able to link to another system? And that's the interesting thing about Vault is you can, there's more than one way to do something, whether it's with items, whether it's with folders. Um, it goes back to trying to think about like long-term, what are, what are the problems you're trying to solve and do you have aspirations of linking your PDM to, P to ERP? There's a great ROI around linking your vault to your ERP in the future. You know, how many times does somebody take a bomb and enter it at ERP, you know, fat finger something, or how long does it take to get that stuff entered? And you got somebody doing that full time when it can automatically be done. That's uh, a big savings. Right. And it, it's good to know, like, File-based life cycles, um, items, those are all Vault Pro features. Um, File-based security settings on the folder or life cycle-based security, all that's Vault Pro features. The, um, the only security feature in Vault Basic is uh, the roles that get assigned to the user. So document consumer, document editor, but it, you know, so you can either have read on all files in Vault or you have read write on all files in Vault with Vault Basic. It's not tell pro that you start to get more granular access on who has access to what in terms of read, write, modify, and download. Yeah, and that applies <clears throat> at the folder level, level at the file level, uh, in this case, item level and stuff like that. So it gives you, professional gives you a lot more flexibility on how you want to control your files and who's allowed to add files to where and things like that. So one of the the perks of, of being a ball professional there. 
I think this is a question. Oh, okay, never mind. That went away. So I have another question from Eden. Uh, is there a way of tuning on spell check in the detailed description section when editing an ECO? Jason, it looks like you're going to answer that question. I don't think so, but it's been a while. So if I open up an ECO, it's like, I don't think that there is any specific feature. Yeah, there is no spell check or feature that I'm aware of to turn on inside of the ECO. That'd be a great one for the, uh, the vault idea station, because that would be very helpful. Uh, got another one here. Um comes from our YouTube. Uh, can you link states from Vault Pro to Microsoft Power App to update uh, Microsoft Smart List? Might be an Adam question. Not out of the box. You would have to do some sort of customization because there's no link. Like the metadata is there, but there's no out of the box connector between those applications. But it sounds like it's in the realm of possibility with some custom programming and using the Vault API. It's definitely worth something. You know, if you reach out, we can explore that if that's something you're interested in. Another question, also multi-site planning. Few vaults, branch offices with limited 100 meg bandwidth, worried of clients not getting the best performance. Any news on edge computing accelerators for Autodesk or should just rely on MSSQ sync? Um, for stuff like that, that that's where you know AVFS servers and um, vault replication come into play so that you have a local copy of the file store, which helps with performance. Um, I'm almost positive there's an article that talks about not using WAN accelerators, because I've seen some weird things happen when it tries to move the data. But a 100 meg bandwidth should be enough for um, for replication. Oh, my last job, you know, had 28 AVFS servers in one you know, main server, we never had, and we had a lot less bandwidth in some of our facilities and never had an issue. So if you have ABS, F, S, replication, you'd be fine. And that's the nice thing, like you can start with an ABF server, and if you need more performance around um, searching, because an AVF server doesn't have a local SQL component, you know, you can always upgrade an AVFS server to a full version of uh, Vault and then do full SQL repl replication, which gets you a local file store and a local uh, database, which helps with searching and stuff like that. What's nice is usually when we're doing uh, full replications like that, um, one of the harder parts is getting a full copy of that file store over to the new location. And in this case, if you're using file store uh, replication already, then you already have one there. So kind of easier to, to go to full replication at that point. Definitely. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, and it's also good to start with an AVFS server because you don't have the expense of a second SQL license. Because to do SQL replication or use an AVFS server, you have to be on Vault Pro because those are pro features. And then so it it's besides the cost of the server, you know, installing an AVFS server is relatively cheap. And then, you know, if need be to go from an AVFS server to full replicated environment that requires a second SQL license. So that's something and it's a lot, about. it's harder to maintain full replication. Yeah, the, the it takes a little bit more um, administrative tasks especially from, what was it, um, Vault 2021 and older, took a lot of IT um, time to maintain replication because that's merge replication. Vault 2022 and newer, they changed it to um, transactional replication, um, which is a lot easier to manage. 
just it's making that the, the second one is just a dummy server with the SQL information on it, right? It's in 2022. It's, in, in 2022, in, transa in transactional replication, everything gets written to the database on the publisher, and then the data is synced one direction to all the subscribers. And so you no longer have a seven-day retention period, meaning that the servers have to stay um, in communication. And so that switch has been fantastic for, um, for maintaining replicated environments. Oh, and I think just from past experience, people were under the impression if I have a replicated environment, if one goes down, I'll be fine with the other, but that is not true. You have one publisher and if that goes down, you're down period. So you're not getting any extra benefit as far as security wise around replication like that. Well, in terms of disaster recovery, correct? Because an emerged replicated environment, depending on which site has uh, there's um, an ownership on the file. And so if that site is down, you can't request the ownership from that file until that replication server goes up. And so all of those kinds of headaches go away when you move to transactional replication, which was implemented in Vault 2022 and newer. And so it makes replication um, a lot more fun to use. Adam and I learned that the hard way. <laughs> yes, we it was, did. It was very yeah. painful. <laughs> Definitely. Well, that goes back to what I say. It's like when you set these things up, you have to test them and 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 write these kind of plans because, you know, the first time to figure out how to rebuild replication is not the time that you want to do it when when everyone's down. Um, and the nice thing about transactional replication is that the process from getting the servers back online are are significantly more simple. Right compared to previous years. Uh, this is more of a comment than a question, Brian. Uh, wrote, I was told the engineering spelling needs to be consistent rather than correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you ask most engineers, they didn't go to school to become an English major. It's all good if it's legible, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> You were taught to print well. That's what I was taught. You have to print really well. Spelling was a secondary option. <laughs> I think we covered this question. Uh, I have a contract and I want them to access my vault. How do I connect them to uh, our vault? I think we covered a little bit, but I think we might be able to talk a little bit more in depth around that. Yeah, that's a great question because it's as we become more of a global company, we need more people need access vault than ever. And so there's two ways, especially if they're an outside contractor is, you know, if we think of vault or a PDM system, it's a, it's a server that's in our internal network. And so to, to let people in, to be able to connect to vault, they either need, you know, VPN access, whether that's software to the network so that they can resolve the IP address or host name of the vault server. Um, or you can set up um, with Vault Pro, you could set up um, Vault Gateway, which requires a dedicated job processor computer. And it requires two licenses, one for the job processor to run and one for Vault Gateway to run. And then when that's set up, you get a public URL that allows um, you to connect to a, a server that's hosted by Autodesk that creates a connection past a company firewall and allows you to connect to um, the vault server. And that works out really interesting because, you know, now you could have contractors if, you know, if they buy their own vault license because it, the vault license is licensed on the client side, um, then they can access your vault server without you having to assign them a license. And without having to worry about, so one of the features that comes with vault gateway or one of the settings that comes there uh is the password has to be a certain uh difficulty or a certain complexity uh so you don't have to worry about a contractor using one two three four five six as their password because or blank or blank yeah um when when logging in from somewhere you know either public or something like that it'll have to be a certain complexity of a password and adds it adds more security to to that login does it require ssl 
or can be over 480? No, when the vault gateway, the the URL that gets generated by Autodesk is a, an HTTPS address to be able to connect to, um, to the vault, and so you're connecting to their server and it's making the connection. Um, and so it, it's just another way to allow people to use it. And again, you know, I, for in Vault Pro 2022, they added the, the ability to be able to log into Vault using your Autodesk ID. And so that works great for contractors so that they don't have to manage a, another password. And then, you know, when, when the contract's done, you can just disable their account on your Vault um, and, and remove their access. And so there's a lot of flexibility there in terms of how you want people to, um, to connect. I think that the, the challenging part is if you have multiple contractors and you want them to all be able to connect to Vault but not see each other's work, um, then you have to do some, use some of the file or folder-based security settings in Vault Pro so that they can't see each other's work, but your local engineers can see all of the files. And so that takes a little bit of planning, but is um, definitely doable. Another question come in. When dealing with the inventor facility add-in features, the assembly asset file is generated with a suffix or unusual string characters causing the assembly file to be duplicated. The original assembly file plus the asset assembly file. This becomes a bit of a cumbersome because of the original file is updated. The asset assembly file does not or located where the original file is is used may not be accurate. What setting is selected um, so that the asset assembly file is not generated? A factory add-on. Yeah, I, I, that makes sense. Um, for the factory add-on. So you want to just upload the assembly file, but not the asset. I'm curious if you have um, like an auto numbering scheme turned on. I don't remember. It might be uh, doing something similar to the, um, the frame generator, where your frame generator adds certain suffixes. Um, that may be on the inventor side though when it's being generated on the so he does not want to generate the an asset assembly so do you want to just vault the libraries and then use that as a way to place in the assembly i guess i'm missing something So you have an auto numbering scheme enabled. I think the biggest thing with um, factory generator is that it's like when when those files go into Vault, not to you know save them locally where you want them, so that when they go into Vault, they're not getting moved, um, so that they get referenced. But I'm curious though. It's like. Why? If the original file is uploaded and the asset assembly file does not, but shouldn't the asset file already be in Vault or is located where the original file is used? May not be accurate. I'll let you think on that one, Jason. Yeah, it might be something we. Yeah, you might want to reach out to email support, and we can find a time. I feel like we'll have to dig into that more in depth um, to see what's going on. Like, is it is it the auto numbering that's doing it, or is there like a workflow that's something that's no breaking the link? Yeah, because that yeah. would be annoying to have to keep fixing the links, especially given the size of factory assemblies. Those are another, not small files. Another question here. Is there a way to remove users 
from uh, the user management area the, only through SQL, IT mistakenly added 50 users. No. You can't remove, you can't remove no. users once they're there. Even through SQL. Well, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's there's no supported way to delete users from all. What you would do is if someone created the users or they got imported, is in in Vault through um, either through the AWS console or the Vault client through tools administration global settings. When you go to the users, all you can do is just uncheck the box that says um, enabled. enabled, and then under View, there's an option that says you know, I think Show it's enabled users only. Yeah. And then that way you won't see them, but they will forever be in the database. And uh, I'll just say that this has been a pain point for a lot of us because I came from a company where we had probably 1,600 you know, users and half of those were disabled because of rotation within the company over the years. And I can tell you from the background, the reason why they do it is because if there's any users associated with any edits within Vault, it would orphan data inside of the database and cause database errors. So uh, as it stands right now, there is no way to delete it by checking to see if they're not associated with anything involved. So you're just kind of out of luck on that one for now. Yeah. yeah and it makes history. That's why it keeps the users. And But in this case, like if they were added by accident and they haven't logged in or created anything, like it'd you, be nice. Yeah. It'd, It'd be, be nice. nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's the same thing about like trying to delete a property. Like if you create a property in Vault and no one's used it, in that place they give you the option to delete it. But as soon as one file uses it, that option disappears yeah. unless you delete all the files that use it. Yeah. It would be nice. It'd be, I'm sure it'd be interesting. I haven't looked if on the Vault idea station if, if someone's added that. I have to imagine someone's already requested that feature. Because it, uh, I believe it comes I did. Up on. <laughs> <laughs> a a long time ago, <laughs> I've been waiting for a couple of years for that one. <laughs> you know? uh, I, and while we're on the subject, there is another thing that I've seen that is an absolute no-no. So I've seen in the past people go in and rename the user to either uh, reuse or something like that. Yeah, don't do that because what happens if there is any data that's associated? with that user, um, for example, let's say you had a user that was there for five years and they were terminated and then you went and you renamed that user to give that account to somebody else, all of the history of everything that happened on releases for files would now have that new user's name on it. So you definitely don't wanna to try to reuse uh, Vault accounts either. Uh, that's a great point. Because that's one of the integrities of Vault in terms of, you know, or any PDM system is that integrity and being able to see when it was checked in, who last modified it, and how did that file evolve. And by renaming accounts, you kind of start to lose that kind of traceability. It is a tempting feature that is not recommended. When Brian Kelly feels the pain <laughs> on the user there. <laughs> We've all been there, right? We... Yes, see it all the time. I don't have any more. I have a, I don't have any more questions. I think we went through a pretty good chunk here. Uh, Vault have rich text <laughs> formatting and Vault change order. We're talking in description, or <laughs> no. Oh, notifications. Uh, well, there's and notifications with that notification wizard that you can add properties, but I don't think that there's not rich text formatting in there. No, it's just it's just a handful of properties that you can configure, but not rich text. I don't know of anywhere where you can like change colors or font or anything like that that would be a cool feature for them to add though yeah yeah if it's coming then it'd be really nice to, to have as a feature yeah 2024 is around the corner i can't should, wait to play with it <laughs> uh, should have a 
More so. Yeah. What kind of fields are you trying to add? Dust and fields. Like from your properties? Like, uh, so you're trying to include more information about the ECO itself? Because right now there are some options to add information about the ECO when you mail it out. Yeah, so in, and when you're customizing the email template, any okay. user-defined yeah. property you should be able to add, including custom fields. I'm sure, uh, yeah. And again, ECOs and email notifications to the Vault Pro feature. Correct. But yeah, you just have to, when you're customizing the email template, you just have to select um, all properties. And then in the list, you should be able to see um, the ones available. The ones available. It might, I suspect that if you're, if you're not seeing the custom fields, I suspect that you're probably would have to associate it to a change order. Yeah. I bet it's a custom property on the change order is probably, um, it, you'd have to test that if all user defined properties or if it's just properties that have the association to change order. I suspect that- it's Change order item and file available that you can include. So you right. should be able to, and this isn't, yeah. Yeah, you should be able to, include properties from any files, items, or change orders that that you have available. So that makes sense. Great question. Okay, I've run out of questions. Great. Huh? Well, there thanks is. everyone for showing up and and coming with fantastic questions this was fun. i know i enjoy these these are great it's more yeah. about learning for everybody well, thank you everybody for showing up i hope everybody has a wonderful afternoon and we'll talk to you guys soon bye bye guys bye